What is going on, i warriors? It's your boy Edward V, and today we're gonna to talk about why Picture Fit is actually wrong when it comes to the intermittent fasting video that he recently put out. Now, his video is chock full of scientific references, scientific studies. So I'm going to try to streamline this as much as I can so that you can understand the major flaws that are in the studies. And unfortunately, PictureFit is just another example of someone misrepresenting data that does not coincide with the intermittent fasting protocol that people are actually using. I'm gonna go ahead and break it all down in this video. Stay tuned. Okay, before I get to the weight loss, fat loss portion of the intermittent fasting breakdown, he, his last thing that he talked about was the autophagy. He talked about how you can receive autophagy from caloric restriction the same way you can do it from intermittent fasting, which I actually do have to agree with him. Caloric restriction does induce a form of autophagy and that can be tested by looking at the influx in the autophagosomes you can look at the skeletal muscle signaling uh, of autophagy taking place and with people using a cycling machine it showed that autophagy was elevated heavily in in that group but the thing with that is because autophagy is simply just a reaction to malnourishment malnutrition is what activates autophagy so yes if you're doing things like cardiovascular heavy workouts, uh, they're going to be breaking down parts of your body. So the autophagy element will be activated. Another thing is caloric restriction. When you're restricting calories, there is a level of malnutrition there which can activate autophagy. When you fast, because you're not eating for a specific amount of time, you're also presenting malnourishment in that small time frame, which can activate autophagy. And there's the difference. Although you can activate levels of autophagy at all times, believe it or not, you're always activating some level of autophagy, albeit not at a great percentage, but there's always some level of self-eating within the cell mechanisms that is going on even though you're not doing anything to activate it. So basically what you're trying to do is elevate the autophagy activity. And when you do caloric restriction, you can do that. When you do fasting, you can do that. But here's the thing, human studies, have shown that you can do it with fasting or caloric restriction. And this was tested. You could actually fast without reducing calories and activate autophagy. The caloric restriction does activate it effectively, but it is because of the caloric restriction. Fasting activates autophagy because of the fasting. Those are two separate things. What if you don't wanna be at a caloric restriction? Then the food element won't be able to do it. You wanna make sure you exercise every day if you want autophagy to be activated every day. That isn't as practical as just utilizing intermittent fasting to activate autophagy. Also, there was a study done in the Journal of Nutrition in 2010 by Erin LeGlynn and colleagues where they simply gave the participants 10 grams of leucine and the 10 grams of leucine completely halted their autophagy production. The mTOR, which is an indicator of autophagy, was completely reduced and Kanasi-1 was completely reduced. So autophagy was actually not happening with, a, with just leucine, a form of protein that was put into the body 10 grams just 60 minutes after. Looking at the control group, they still had a higher elevation of autophagy going on. So food can actually knock you out of autophagy, which is why intermittent fasting can provide a more effective and consistent way of activating higher levels of autophagy. Now that we got the autophagy parts out of the way, let's move into the fat loss portion. Now, one of my biggest gripes is that all the studies that are utilized are always studies that allow the participants to consume calories during their fasting periods be it the fasting day or the fasting time frame or whatever it is, they're allowed to consume up to 25%. Sometimes they're allowed to consume from 800 to 1000 calories, which will not put them in the position 
where they can utilize fat mobilization as effectively as possible with all the hormonal elements that activate when you consume zero calories. So zero caloric intake is important. There are studies out there that have zero caloric intake, but every time there's an argument against intermittent fasting, the studies that are used are the ones that do not provide zero caloric intake. Now, looking at the first study that he mentioned, the one done on women, they were allowed 25% of their caloric intake for their fasting days. This is essentially a severe caloric restriction day with a caloric surplus day versus people who are just doing calorie restriction. So that first study, and I'll have those linked down below, you can check it out for yourself, is not a valid study representing intermittent fasting in the way that most likely you are utilizing the protocol. Picture Fit himself even stated that the most popular protocol is the 16-8 method. The most popular of all intermittent fasting protocols is the 16-8 approach. Yet none of his studies None of them that he's presented, and he has a long list of them in his description. None of them are the 16-8 or looking at the 16-8 or utilizing the 16-8 within the meta-analysis. None of them. The majority of them are allowing you to consume calories during your fasting time frame. Now he has the resistance training one where you cannot consume calories outside of your eating window and they use the warrior diet setup actually where their person ate their calories within four hours and didn't eat it within a 20 hour range so 20 hours of fasting four hours of eating versus people who were just eating but the major issue with this and one of the issues that i'm always explaining to you guys is that they were able to eat ad libitum so was the control group they can eat ad libitum ad libitum meaning that you can eat as much as you want with no control at all with no restrictions you can eat what you want as much as you want it doesn't matter that is extremely flawed to try to see if intermittent fasting when calories are accounted for as well as protein can actually give you a beneficial outcome with body fat reduction you can't do that if they're able to eat ad libitum so it showed that People who eat whatever they want versus people who do intermittent fasting and eat whatever they want are going to have very similar outcomes. Yes, because we don't know what they're eating and how much they're eating. Calories still matter if you're intermittent fasting or if you're not intermittent fasting. A better study design would be to have the trained athletes have a specific caloric intake limit in which the total numbers match that of the group that was doing intermittent fasting and then determine what the results are from there. And luckily we have a study that does that. Trained athletes using the 16-8 method showed a significant reduction in body fat versus those trained athletes who were not not doing intermittent fasting and the protocol that was used was the 16-8 method. It's very interesting that Picture Fit decided not to use this trained athlete study and decided to use the one where they allow them to eat ad libitum and it wasn't even the 16-8 which he touted as the more popular method and the link to that study will be down in the description below. Now the 2016 meta-analysis that had six trials, all six trials unfortunately are flawed. Why? Because they allow calorie intake during the fasting period. The first one allowed 25% energy intake during your fasting time frame. The second one allowed 25% calorie intake during your fasting period. The third one is simply after 12 months, after 12 months they didn't test them daily or weekly and see what where their bodies were and, and, and make sure that they're controlling for what they're eating. They didn't do that. They gave them a questionnaire after 12 months and told them, basically, did you fast during these time frames? And then they just marked yes and no. They weighed them, they looked at their body composition and determined that people who stated that they didn't fast and people who stated that they did fast it was all the same. That's the third study that was included in the meta-analysis. The fourth study is not even called intermittent fasting, it's called VLCD, which is what? Very low caloric diet, not intermittent fasting. They were able to eat 520 calories during those VLCD timeframes. That is extremely misleading because it's being put in the bucket of intermittent fasting, when in reality, they're not fasting. The sixth study is ridiculous. It has nothing to do with intermittent fasting at all. 
It's basically weight management versus non-weight management. And they want to test to see adherence, basically. They want to test to see why people, after about, about six months, fall off of whatever diet that they're using. So they basically test it to see if it's a psychological thing or if it's a bounce back thing or if it's a six month thing. So they abruptly stopped them from doing weight management earlier than six months. And then they test to see if there's any like uh, bounce back effect in gaining weight that's not <laughs> intermittent fasting at all that's not intermittent fasting at all but unfortunately that is what uh is part of that meta-analysis and then we move on to the 40 study systematic review which i've already in detail dove into and because it was so much detail that I put in there uh, during the video where I talked about why Jeremy Ether was wrong. And he used that 40 study systematic review as his, uh, his reasoning for that. I'm going to go ahead and insert that clip here. So I do not have to reiterate the, uh, the points and the research that I did in that video. Just uh, sit back and you'll see why that 40 study meta analysis is extremely flawed and it's very similar to why this six study meta-analysis is extremely flawed so in the study itself there were reviews that looked at weight loss alone without looking at body fat i didn't care to look at those now let's go ahead and critique this systematic review now the systematic review is claimed to be 40 different studies looking at calorie restriction and intermittent fasting when calories and protein are equated for but none of those two things are happening one calories and protein aren't equated for some of the studies let you eat protein ad libitum and ad libitum means that you can eat as much protein as you want there isn't a restriction there some restricting carbs but not restricting protein some restricting protein but not carbs so there is protein isn't being equated for based on this study and then calories are not even being equated for some people can eat a certain amount of calories on one day and then the next day they can eat ad libitum as much as they want it doesn't matter they don't have to pay attention to it and i looked at the design model for all of these studies and they were all that way individually looking at the studies you can see that there are many many flaws to this systematic review and then this systematic review starts to deteriorate more and more as you look more into it and start to look at when the comparisons are being done to caloric restriction now of the 40 studies Studies, only 12 actually compared caloric restriction with intermittent fasting so the rest of those studies are just simply a look at what intermittent fasting or intermittent energy restriction can do to your body and there are many comparative studies with Ramadan versus caloric restrictions that exist but this publication for some reason stated that they wanted to omit any Ramadan studies that had anything to do with Ramadan because it didn't fit the protocol of intermittent fasting and by that they mean the popular methods like five two diet the 16 8 diet the warrior diet one meal a day etc they, they it didn't fit that protocol but then if you look at the studies that they did include there's one from the journal of north american menopause society and their setup was five weeks of continuous caloric restriction normal caloric restriction versus five weeks of caloric maintenance. And they considered that the intermittent fasting protocol versus the caloric restriction protocol, which was 15 weeks of caloric restriction with five weeks of maintenance. That is that is not anywhere near intermittent fasting. That's what you guys have to look into when you see these systematic reviews, these meta-analysis. What's the actual protocol and is it truly intermittent fasting? Are you eating zero calories, 100% energy restriction versus days or hours where there is energy restriction? Because that is truly intermittent fasting. You have to understand that if calories are allowed to be consumed during the fasting time, there are so many metabolic and hormonal functions that will not activate. I'll link the studies to the 15 clinical trials done by Dr. Steven Anton as he touches on that metabolic switch and he breaks it down perfectly so that you understand that after a certain period of literally not consuming anything is when your body switches over. If you're not allowing that switch over to happen, those extra significant benefits benefits will not be seen. So there's 12 studies that even compare caloric restrictions with intermittent fasting. And then of those 12 studies, only five studies even looked at body fat mass. So now we've taken this entire mountain of studies of 40 clinical trials. We've reduced it to 12 that even compare caloric restrictions with intermittent fasting. And then we reduce those 12 to five that even compare intermittent fasting with caloric restriction in terms of body fat mass loss. And of all five of these, well, one was the one that I mentioned with the five weeks of caloric restriction and then five weeks of caloric maintenance. Two of them were from the International Journal of Obesity, one which allowed over a thousand calories on your fasting days. The other one allowed about 600 and something calories.
calories on your fasting days. Another one was from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, which allowed 600 calories on your fasting days. And the other one was from the British Journal of Nutrition, which allowed you to eat fat and protein ab libitum and was only restricting carbohydrates. So of all of these five studies comparing intermittent fasting with caloric restriction, none of them actually compared intermittent fasting with caloric restriction. So we've whittled down all these 40 studies to just 12 to just five and then those five don't even do what they're supposed to be doing so if you look at the presentation of this study given by someone like Jeremy what you will think in your head is that there have been 40 studies looking at zero calorie intake days or hours versus feeding days or hours versus just caloric restriction so there you have it guys it's very misleading when they bring up these studies the title of the studies mislead you because it says intermittent fasting shows no superior benefit to caloric restriction restriction. However, they're not actually testing intermittent fasting. If you want to see studies that show zero caloric intake, where calories are controlled for, where it's randomized, where they do crossover, I will have a link to three studies below. One being the OMAS study, which is shows a significant reduction uh, in body fat versus the control group, even though they were both supposed to consume at maintenance. A time-restricted feeding study, which is the 16-8 study done with women that show a significant benefit benefits, health benefits as well, and also the weight training, uh, resistance trained males, where you can literally compare them apples to apples to the resistance trained male studies that was presented by PictureFit. But unlike that study, this study actually controlled for the calorie intake, which the other study just let them eat ab libitum. All of that will be linked down in the description below. All of the studies that he placed and references will be linked in the description below as well if you want to take a look at that and i'll just continue this mission of always creating the rebuttal so that you guys fully understand what studies being presented to you it's not just a conclusion you have to look deep into these studies to see if they actually represent the intermittent fasting protocol that you're doing so i hope that this video was very helpful and of course i want to thank my patrons from my patreon and i'm going to go ahead and put their names right up here